So I think we can start the webinar tonight. I think we've got uh, everyone in the room. I think the numbers now um, stopped increasing. So welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the session tonight and finding the time. Uh, we've got um, amazing, what is it, 164 people logged in. So that's a really, really great number to see. I think we had something like 380 people registered, which is amazing and I had lots of emails saying uh, people couldn't join in and are really looking forward to the recording. So that's really exciting to see so many people interested in the topic of conservation grazing. Who would have thought that uh, it's such a popular topic? And I'm really hoping that it's just reflecting the kind of general and trend on the outside of, of people being more interested in the topic and hopefully also using it more in practice on their land. So my name is Lucia Chmurova and I work for Plant Likes Magnificent Meadows Wells project. I'll be chairing the session tonight. Uh, so this session is the first part in a series of three on conservation grazing on grassland. And the first session will be starting with the introduction to the topic uh, and is brought to you in a collaboration of Plant Life and Pond. So just very quickly about our uh, organizations. In case you are not familiar with Plant Life, uh, we are a conservation organization working across the UK towards conservation of wildflowers, other plants and fungi as well, working all around the UK. So if you would like to check out our website for the most uh, recent and current um, surveys and campaigns and projects, please do so. Uh, for my project, uh, Magnificent Meadows Wales, we are a three-year project started in 2019 in summer and we are funded by the Welsh Government with the main um, partners being National Trust and Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. And we are working towards increasing the extent of uh, meadows uh, across Wales, but also increasing uh, the interest and engagement with meadows. So working on various different scales, starting with kind of smaller garden type scales, working with schools, hospitals, but also going into larger scale restorations with national trust across the country. So this is where this topic of conservation grazing really fits in. And we invited lots of um, people that are hopefully already grazing or just starting to think about maybe getting into conservation grazing or just, just out of interest. Um, for Pond, um, it's an organization that is really bringing together information and knowledge and experience and expertise on farming and grazing all across Wales. Um, they work with lots of different audiences as well. So anything from governmental bodies to uh, um, farming industries and uh, private individuals, but they're really trying to think of kind of practical solutions with these people that work for all uh, nature, animals, but also people. And they do this via offering lots of professional advice um, and training and lots of different uh, resources and uh, activities as well. So with, from Pond, we've got Hilary Keyhole here uh, tonight with us. She's going to be our lead speaker. Uh, Hilary is very experienced in giving advice uh, all around Wales and beyond on conservation grazing and in the farming sector. Uh, she, for Pond, she's the lead uh, farming advisor and also in charge of uh, the training program that they offer. And this is a training combination of uh, accredited trainings and also bespoke training. Hilary also farms on her own farm in North Wales and runs business and enterprises from there. So she will be starting off the session tonight, um, starting with the kind of introduction to the topic. And we also have three other panelists here and contributors with us tonight, but I'll leave that to um, Hilary to introduce them to you and then at the end, so we've got an hour for presentations and then half an hour for questions and answers at the end. Uh, just a very few technical bits before we start. For those who haven't used the webinar option on Zoom, it's slightly different to a meeting, uh, just in that, that when you enter the room, uh, your microphones and cameras are automatically turned off. And also you've got the addition of the Q&A box at the, at the bottom. So if you look at the panel, you've got the chat. So please keep the conversation going there have a chat there. Um, but if you've got any specific questions to our panelists, please, if you can put them into the Q&A box, uh, you can say who they are aimed for, or if you just have a general question, I can then make a selection and read them out at the end. So yeah, if you can put it in the Q&A box, they'll make it really much easier for me to uh, pick them out at the end. 
We also have got Cassie and Emma um, in the background um, helping me with just looking after the general smoothness and they also keep the conversation going in the chat and we'll, we'll be putting useful links and contacts for you throughout the session. So yeah, I think that's on the technical bit and introduction. Uh, we've got a um, really exciting selection of uh, speakers here with us tonight. So yeah, let's get started. Uh, Hilary, over to you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Um, just... So this is Plant Life Magnificent Meadow Cymru Partnership, an introduction to conservation grazing and its practicalities. So I'm Hilary, I farm with my family in North Wales, where we run cattle, sheep and ponies from our small farm, grazing nature reserves, including fungi grasslands, lapwing wetlands, Anglesey fens and sand dune coastal heathland systems. I also work for Pont, Wales's grazing organisation and the Nature Friendly Farming Network. My fellow presenters are Bill Grayson, my grazing hero, who's got many years of practical experience and buckets of research knowledge. He's going to talk about his conservation grazing business and outline the practical aspects of his grazing restoration of limestone grassland. Mark Barber, who's worked for many years for amphibian and reptile conservation, will tell you about how we can manage for reptiles, which isn't often discussed as a grazing topic. So Larry Fielden is a fairly new entrant into farming, not far from me in North Wales who is on a very steep learning curve and so is ideally placed to explain what really matters when setting up a farming wildlife system. So here's an outline of what we're going to cover this evening, just to give an overview of the steps you need to take to establish and manage a conservation grazing regime. So we'll talk about um, what's conservation grazing, does it work financially, how animals graze and the selection of animals for sites, infrastructure, fencing, water and handling, a bit about legislation, diseases and poisonous plants, working with farmers and graziers, and then Mark will talk about grazing for reptiles, Bill about the Morecambe Bay Conservation Grazing Scheme, and Tulare on upland conservation grazing. And then at the end, there'll be a question and answer with the panel. So what is conservation grazing? It's grazing for the benefit of wildlife, landscape, and cultural heritage. It's usually less intensive than commercial farming, and the type of livestock is really important. You need hardy animals to manage on un unimproved habitats and conservation grazing is very much part of our cultural heritage. That's rhubarb, that cow. So what livestock can achieve? It's, they're great for attracting insects. This was the first dung beetle on a site on the Gower in 35 years um, and he came in about 10 days after the livestock were introduced there. You can get 250 different types of invertebrate and cattle dung. So it's pretty important. They're great at removal of biomass, keeping sites from scrubbing up and delaying reversion or restoring them. They're great at trampling to create areas of bare ground for regeneration and niches for invertebrates and herpetiles, and obviously grazing and browsing. They can cause physical changes in structural diversity through scratching and just moving about through the bushes. So high levels of that might limit scrub expansion or reduce scrub cover. Carbon cycling is really important these days and extensive livestock are positive links in carbon sequestration. Grazing is important. It's an essential part of agricultural systems and it's part of our natural ecosystem. It's created the landscape that we see today and animals are an attractive part of the landscape. They can be beneficial for people involved with them, stock checkers and the sort of the mental health of people. We, we find that sometimes I get people helping me to check my livestock and they report into me every day and um, they say it really helps sort of avoid depression being out and having something to care for. For access it's important that livestock use the paths and keep keep those open and this is this is one of the stock checkers. It's important for the local economy, um, for local produce, we've got reduced food miles if people eat local food and food produced on nature reserves is free from chemicals and much better for you with higher omega-3s. It's great for fire prevention. There's Last year there were loads of fires sort of in Llangollen and across heaths and moorlands and if animals are browsing and grazing and keeping the vegetation down then there's less chance of fires spreading. 
and tradition. There's a long history of grazing since the dawn of agriculture and farms are, are important parts of local communities. This slide looks really confusing, but I just wanted to put it in quickly because Chris Clark of Nethergill Associates, who is the chair of Nature and New Farming Network in England, has developed the less is more principle. So very briefly, the productive variable costs, which are this line here, they're what you spend on feed and medicines, etc., that vary with the size of the enterprise. And once you pass the maximum sustainable output of natural grasslands and habitats of the farm, you end up spending more for every unit of additional pr production you get. So that's where the line goes, goes up and they become corrective variable costs. So nature is a stakeholder in the farm business and we should definitely account for it because the, the variable costs are productive as long as the grass that's growing is feeding the livestock and you're not buying lots of extra feed and fertilizer to grow more. Where income and revenue meets the productive variable costs, which is here, is the break even point. Uh, the fixed costs are taken into account there and then you're breaking even. So on this piece here that's shaded, this is where you're actually, you've got a profit margin. At the moment, farms are supported through the single farm payment. And this line at the top is the revenue plus the support. So a lot of farmers are missing the fact that actually they're breaking even here. And this is where their profit is because they, they're seeing the total income, including their support. But support rules are changing in the next couple of years. So I think we need to think about managing without it or seeing you know, how, it, how it is different. I know that our farm business uh, farm support is 40% of our total farm income. So what we're aiming at is a, this sweet spot where our productive variable costs are uh, meeting up with the production of the grass and we want to sort of not push our enterprises beyond that level. So conservation grazing, working with nature and using natural capital makes the best of our maximum sustainable output. It's really important. And you can make the best income by producing added value products, being grass fed and nature friendly. So on our farm, we do a bit of boxed beef and lamb, and that is a lot more profitable than just taking things straight to market. So conservation grazing avoids having to spend on corrective variable costs and makes use of nature's bounty. So when we're thinking about conservation grazing a site, we need to work out what we're trying to achieve. So an initial survey and a check of designations and management plans will identify habitats and species which will determine grazing management. Timing, type, breed and class and stocking density of grazing animals all influence the results. So it helps to know how animals graze. So cattle have a very long tongue, as you can see, and teeth on the bottom jaw and a bony pad on the top. They eat their wrap and pull graziers and their ruminants, they have three stomachs and they sort of eat the grass, it goes into their rumen and then they regurgitate that and chew the cud and send it down to another stomach where it's digested by microorganisms in the gut. And the cattle don't actually get their energy from the grass that they eat, they get their energy from the microorganisms that are digesting the grass. Cattle leave a longer sward, about six centimetres and they're not selective, they just graze across the grassland and they trample it and leave a complex sward of different heights. Ponies, you can see, have got teeth top and bottom and not such long tongues. They're not selective and they're not ruminants. They don't promote a complex sward. They graze lower down to a couple of centimetres and they dung in latrine areas, which can become over enriched. Sheep are ruminants too. They select flowers very carefully and they'll graze very short. They dung everywhere and graze next to the dung. They can be great for managing for wax cap fungi and winter hay meadow grazing. And some breeds like Herdwick sheep are good for browsing and scrub clearance. So for appropriate grazing, it's important to choose the right species of livestock and the right class of livestock. It's also important for the timing. You might want to ensure that flowers bloom and set seed or ground nesting birds are protected. Or in woodlands, regeneration may be encouraged or discouraged depending on whether you graze in the spring or in the autumn. The stocking density is important. High densities used for short periods will affect a rapid change. And this speed of change might be harmful to the associated fauna and it might cause compaction and damage to vegetation structure that can take years to reverse. 
this is one of our sites that we manage for lapwing and we're taking the grass down very quickly there in the autumn ready for when everything comes off in February when the lapwings want to nest because you want a very short sward for that. Low densities of stock allow enough forage for animals to be selective though and change is more gradual and time can be taken to evaluate the effects of grazing. So this is a picture from the Gower um, on a, a housing estate adjacent to a common and they don't have any cattle grids off the common. So the cattle go and um, do a bit of daffodil grazing. Um, you can use various things to keep the livestock in place. They'll travel maybe a kilometre and a half away from water. So sighting your water can, can be sort of helpful. A kilometre and a half is a long way, but it might. There's a site called Breakwater Park near Hollyhead where the water is at one end of the site and we, we don't have any water further up because there's a very delicate headland with Janister and lovely heathland at the other end. And we only want them to go there very occasionally and that seems to work quite well. You can use mineral blocks because they'll sort of go back to those every so often when they need some minerals. Electric fencing is a good quick temporary technique. Um, I'll talk about a bit about electric fencing later. And then invisible fencing and geofencing. Geofencing is quite a new system, which um, Emma, who is in Pont and is part of this, um, this presentation, is trialing it at the moment. So that is where you have an app on a phone and you draw on, on the phone where the animals can go. And then they wear a collar and they get an audible signal when they reach the edge of the boundary, followed by a shock when they actually hit the boundary. Um, she's been training cattle to respond to geofencing using visible electric fencing and it's working really well. It's going to make a big difference to conservation grazing because we'll be able to have cattle in the uplands and herds won't be able to mix because we'll have a boundary with maybe 500 metres between it. Um, we can use it on commons which have got roads going across and we won't have to fence the commons but the livestock won't be killed on the roads. It's going to really open things up. Shelter's important. Um, natural shelter is fine using topography of the ground or trees or bushes. Animals need, they're fine when it's very cold and they're fine when it's very wet. If it's cold and wet, they can end up getting chilly. So you need to make sure they can shelter from one or the other. Close shepherding is a technique I'm going to talk about in a minute. And liming is something that farms on Dartmoor have been using to sweeten up the, the vegetation a bit and just hold the animals to a bit of a, a heft or a canevin, a place where they live. And then vegetation management can be used like that, where you've got a lot of rank vegetation. If you cut it back and remove it and you get some regrowth, the livestock will want to eat that. So different kinds of infrastructure, fencing. This is some um, chestnut fencing on Breakwater Park, which fits in really well with the landscape and it's quite long lasting. Cattle grids, water installation, handling and loading pens are really important. If if anyone, if you ask a farmer to go and look at a site, he's going to want to know how he can get his cattle on and off it. Uh, shelter and lying up areas. So um, when, when you're grazing a fen or something, you might want to think you can just put a fence directly around the fen, but actually you need to leave a fairly reasonable size area for cattle to go and lie or sheep and ponies to go and lie and chew the cud if they're ruminants and just um, not be standing in water all the time. So choice of fencing is dependent on what type of stock of grazing and the aesthetics and the ground conditions. Tunnelized posts as shown here are reasonably long lasting. Best to get the ones with a maximum length of guarantee. Where you've got um, rock, you can use Clipex fencing, which is metal posts and you can put those in the ground using resin to keep them secure. They don't fit in brilliantly in the countryside but they do last for a very long time. Um, electric fencing is suitable, it can be temporary or permanent. You have to check that it doesn't short on vegetation. You can get solar or battery units but um, they're quite prone to being stolen as I've discovered and so it's good to have a box that's secured to a metal pole that's concrete in the ground or something if, if that is a possibility. Because if you lose your fence, if you lose your power unit, then the stock can get through the fence and that can lead to problems. 
You can use water to manage areas for grazing. Um, on some sites we have troughs, even though there is natural water. On one place, the farmer is worried that cattle next door don't have his level of disease. Um, he's, he's very health conscious, so they're not such a high health and welfare unit. So he would rather his cattle didn't drink water that the other cattle have been paddling in. So we've got troughs and his cattle go and use them. You can see his belted Galloway standing and having a wallow, but he'll choose to go and drink from the trough that is just across the field. You can um, provide water using an intermediate bulk container, a great big juice container or a bowser with a trough that you just take and fill up. And that, that can be very handy if quite a lot of sites don't have water. Um, cows with calves will drink up to 50 litres of water a day and sheep, if the if the vegetation's very lush, they may not need any, any water, otherwise they might take up to 10 litres and a pony might take up to 23. Bridges can be useful for access and to reduce poaching on wetlands. It's generally a good idea to put a splay mat on the end so that you don't get a massive sort of area of poaching just as um, the animals get onto the bridge. If you've got young stock, you might need a rail or a lip on the edge of the the bridge just to let them know where it is so they don't get pushed off but older cattle and sheep usually just wander across and they're usually fine. So a quick look at different grazing systems. Set stocking is um, where animals graze an area extensively all the time. They return to favoured plants and keep the whole site fairly uniform so there is a sort of perception that maybe the less palatable species get um, more opportunity to grow than the palatable things. Um, on a really large area that's set stocked with low stocking rate, then that's less likely to happen because there's going to be surplus vegetation anyway. Rotational grazing is better for the recovery of plants. And holistic plan grazing sort of uses the rotational principle. There's a, a rule of thirds where um, they eat a third of the, the grass, they trample in a third of the grass and they leave behind a third of the grass. On, on the holistic plan grazing, they'll only spend maybe a day, maybe two days on a field, which will be quite often electric fenced in sort of strips and you move the fence up behind the animals so that they don't run back onto the area that they've already grazed. It can result in a 20% increase in production. They don't go back onto the bit they've grazed for about, well, between 40 and 70 days. So the grass gets a chance, or the vegetation gets a chance to flower and set seed. It's good for pollinators. And the trampling of the grass into the, the soil is really good for the soil, increasing the organic matter. Mob grazing, as we discussed earlier, is a, a way of doing quick vegetation control, but you do have to be very careful not to do too much damage. It can be useful just for a quick clearance of, of scrub or a particular plant that you're trying to get rid of. Electric fence exclusion can be handy if you've got orchids in one corner of a field, but you need to graze it, then you can fence around those so to, uh, they won't go and eat them. And then pulse grazing is where the animals just spend a, a brief period of time, or it might be a few months somewhere. It's quite often used in woodlands where they can change the habitat quite quickly. Woodlands can be quite sensitive. So you graze just for a month or two and then take the livestock out. And then maybe the next year you might miss or you might graze again the next year and then miss a couple of years. And you, you work out sort of what sort of grazing you want to do really by what you've got and how you want it, how you want it to behave and what sort of, life, what sort of um, wildlife you're managing for. Close shepherding is, um, we've got two sites that we're doing close shepherding on Anglesey. Um, this is Hollyhead Mountain, and they have a flock of 250 Manx Lockton and Hebridean sheep. Uh, the shepherd takes them up for um, 80 days, starting usually end of August, early September. It's managed by the RSPB, and um, when there isn't COVID, you can actually spend the day out with the shepherd if you talk to the RSPB about it. The, the sheep are interesting in the way they, they behave in the course of a day grazing. So in the morning, they want high protein, high energy, lots of, of really good nutrition. So Pete the Shepherd takes them out and they'll just, they'll, he takes them somewhere and they'll just eat lots of nutritious food. 
and then they sit and rest. And in the afternoon, all they want to do is fill their bellies. So he can take them where there's deer grass or another sort of plant that they don't usually choose to eat, but they will just fill up on. So it can be a really good way of, of managing uh, the vegetation that you've got. This is Chris the shepherd on Aberfrau. So this is a big sand dune system with a big road going across. And he shepherds these cattle for three months of the year from, I think that's September-ish for three months. Um, the cattle know they go back to pens at night as the sheep on, um, on South Stack do, so that they're hungry when they go out in the morning and they'll do a good job of managing these, these areas. I know it's easy to want to bury your head when you're thinking about legislation, but um, it's something we need, really need to think about when we're planning conservation grazing. So there's animal identification. So cattle and sheep are ear tagged. They have an electronic tag in one ear. Cattle will have to have that soon. Sheep have to have it now. And just a, a copy tag in the other ear in case they lose the electronic one. Um, ponies have a microchip unless they're semi-feral on a mountain and you know exactly who they are, you can get a derogation, but mostly as soon as a pony isn't a, a semi-feral pony, then it, it has to be microchipped and have a passport. Uh, they all have an individual number and um, you have to report when you move them between holdings and onto and off sites. For ponies, you don't report, but you should have the passport with the pony and for sheep, um, they don't have a passport, but you record their movements and report that online or on paper. The Crow Act, um, you just need to think about that uh, in terms of access to uh, open land, just having to um, think about signage and management of people with dogs. Other designations such as AONB or wildlife sites or triple SIs, can affect whether you've actually got consent to start grazing them. You have to make sure you've got section 28 consent for change of use if you're starting to graze a triple SI. And there might be fencing and infrastructure consents to get for AONBs and wildlife sites. The movement legislation, again, is um, reporting the movements of the livestock. If you're using cattle, goats, pigs or deer in your land, you need to register your land holding with the Rural Land Registry and get a CPH, a County Parish Holding Number, from the Rural Payments Agency. And to have livestock, you need to become a registered keeper. If a local grazier is bringing their livestock onto your land, they'll need to obtain a temporary CPH number by contacting the, the, the local office and then and they would be the registered keepers of the land. So then it would be up to them to manage the legal side of animal ownership. It sounds like a bit of a minefield. There's lots of really good advice online on sort of DEFRA websites and your local council trading standards. Horses aren't classified as livestock and many of these regulations don't apply to them, which makes them a good choice if you're establishing grazing on a site where you work out how grazing will be received. Waste management, that's just if an animal dies on on the land, you have to remove it. You're not allowed to just leave it there or bury it on site unless it's very remote or you're on an island. So you need to think about access to the site with maybe a mini digger or a quad bike or something to remove livestock. The Animal Welfare Act 2006 is really practical and pragmatic. It um, introduces the five freedoms which relate to animal health and welfare um, for animals' rights to to be on a site, on a place without having pain or suffering, having enough food and water and not being stressed. And they're really useful things to bear in mind when you're risk assessing the site. If you look on the Grazing Animals Partnership website, that's got information about the five freedoms. And then good environmental and agricultural condition is what farmers have to keep their land in in order to claim their single farm payment. And it's really just about not having animals hock deep in mud and having proper fencing and proper provision for water and food and looking after them right. A quick look at um, diseases. So liver fluke is um, that affects sheep and cattle. 
It has a life cycle that involves the mud snail. It's more prevalent on wetland. Red water, again, is another wetland disease. So, so with liver fluke, they'll get a bottle jaw. They might get a baggy jaw if they've got it, and you can, you can fluke drench them. You can get a fluke forecast online on the, um, on the sort of animal health website. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the, the link for that. I'll have to put that up later. Red water is carried by ticks. It's a babesia organism and they, they pass water that is red and you've got a few days in which to treat them. Once they start doing that, they can recover. You can heft cattle to red water. So if calves go on the site and get bitten by a tick and infected before they're six months, they develop an immunity, which you can then top up every year by putting them back on the site every year. And that's really the best way to manage it. It's not very nice if you get it. Neosporosis is sort of a fairly recent problem, I think. It's carried by dogs and it causes abortion and infertility in cattle. So on a site where there's lots of dog walking, we've got a site in Bangor, which we manage for grassland fungi. We never put a heifer that we would want to breed from there. Um, there isn't a cure for it and you, you just have to cull any animals that get it. Worms affect young stock more than older animals. Um, and I'll talk about um, avamectins in a minute. There we are, avamectins. So you can treat worms and external parasites using ivermectin, which is a chemical, but it's passed out into the dung for several weeks after they've been treated with it, and it will kill any animals that come and live in the dung or use it. So you really don't want tre animals treated with ivermectins to be on conservation sites but they're really useful in managing livestock. So we treat our sheep against scab, sheep scab, when we bring them home and just have them in a field for a couple of weeks, one place, and we don't do everything at once. So we might have a few sheep that we haven't done and have them in a different field and then treat them when the others are through their ivermectin period. Um, Dr. Sarah Bainon, and um, the dung beetle lady has got a really good fact sheet about um, the chemicals in wormers and which have the least effect on, on animals. So she's worth looking up. Poisonous plants, Bill's going to say something about yew trees in a minute, um, which is really interesting, but it can be poisonous to livestock. Sycamore, when it sheds its seeds, that's a problem for ponies. So you shouldn't really have horses where there's sycamore seeds being dropped just for that time period. Ragwort, well, there's ponies standing in a field of ragwort. While it's growing, they generally don't bother with it, but when it wilts or if it's cut into hay, they will eat it and it can cause liver damage. But you can graze sheep on rag ragwort rosettes when they're small and they don't seem to suffer too much ill effects. Hemlock water dropwort is a problem along water edges. The leaves are poisonous, but the roots are a lot more poisonous. So they can graze a few leaves, but you don't want them to, to get to the roots. And then rhododendron and laurel, they won't eat it unless they're fairly short of, of forage. So you wouldn't put livestock where there wasn't much forage and there was rhododendron and laurel. And then photosensitive plants like St. John's wort and bog asphodel will cause the animals to get sunburn after they've eat, eaten them. So we've had ponies who get very swollen noses from eating St. John's wort. Cattle leasing is a good way if you're an organisation or you've got a project to get somebody started. So you might have a farmer who's maybe got cattle but not um, traditional or native breeds that might be suitable for the conservation grazing you've got to do. And these were bought for somebody, they're, they're um, Devon Reds and they were bought because he had, I think he had continentals and he wanted something he could put out on the common. So he had these five and he's now bred them up and there's 35 of them. He's got an agreement for five years and at the end of the five years, he can return animals of the same age group as those that he originally had, or he can hang on and, and have another agreement for another five years. It's just a really good way of giving someone confidence to, to start out on a scheme. Dogs and their owners, you've got to think about. Um, they're an important part of decision-making and the choice of livestock. Dogs 
can worry sheep and goats. Um, on Anglesey, we've had dogs chasing cattle off the cliff. And then on the other side, you can have dogs attacking, uh, cattle attacking a dog and killing the, the owner of the dog. So it's important on your signage to have, keep your dog on a lead, but let it go if the cattle come after you without scaring anybody. It's really important to work with the community really before you put animals on a site, where, which is heavily dog walked. Um, put out a leaflet explaining what you want to do, have an event. Uh, we have dog shows on some sites and people come along and then you can talk to them about how to behave and, and I sort of do walking with animals, just take them for a walk with the cattle and show them how to behave and how to walk. Friends of groups are really useful. And, and if you've got a ranger on site and they've got a dog, that sort of helps in getting them to talk to, to the dog owners. At Kenvig Nature Reserve, they've got the fen orchid. So they've got cattle and sheep managing the, the sand dunes area for that and the grasslands. But they have a big problem with sheep worrying. So we had a hooves and hounds event. Uh, we invited people to come and see the sheep. And the cattle and sheep have got collars on. So uh, it's called the Digital Shepherd. Um, the location of the livestock is shown on an app, which dog walkers or visitors to the site can log into. And then they can work out, they can find out where they are. And the site is big enough. It's a few hundred hectares. They can learn, they can walk where the animals aren't. So that is working quite well. So just to round up, that's just a very quick whistle stop tour of, of things to look out for, for conservation grazing. If you want to follow up on some of this and on some interesting project in, innovations and new ways of working, have a look at, um, that there's a project coming up in Wales called Dance Your Dibbin. It's not live yet, it's going out in June, but if you look on the Tira Moor site, which is uh, something to see, in Gwynedd, that will give you indications of where to look for this really interesting program supporting farming and wildlife. So now I'm going to hand over to um, Mark, who's going to talk about reptiles. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hilary. I'll just try and share my screen. Brilliant. So I work for, oops, sorry. I work for Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust for about 10 years now, uh, currently on our Connecting the Dragons project, which is a national lottery, a heritage fund a project across um, southern Wales. And so I've just got a quick five minute slot just to try and um, get the conversation going about uh, considering reptiles, but also amphibians uh, when managing grasslands and uh, thinking about uh, grazing. So I've got three things I'm gonna um, quickly talk about. So firstly, it's just to say that reptiles love scrubby edges. So bracken, gorse, heather, bramble, that's their kind of preferred habitats. And so kind of this ecotone between the shorter grassland, the ranker grassland, and then going into this scrubby habitat is really what they prefer. And so clearly you don't want this habitat everywhere, smothering all of your imported grasslands, but it would be really great if people think about, the, about it as an important feature in itself, not just for reptiles, um, but also for all uh, wildlife, you know, small mammals, uh, birds, they all really uh, love it and it's really uh, important. So yeah, I'd really encourage people to make sure they don't uh, feel the need to push it too far off their site and, and leave some areas. And so when uh, really reptiles aren't the biggest fan of uh, grazing, uh, it's, it's a tricky balance uh, to get right. And often uh, incorrect grazing for reptiles can, even if you've got some scrubby habitat in the corner, often they can kind of remove that kind of structure, that edge between uh, the shorter and the scrubbier vegetation that they like to bask on and live in. So you do have to be quite careful. Uh, you can look at the Reptile Habitat Management Handbook for more information on that. Um, the other point I wanted to make uh, with this particular topic was about, uh, Hilary mentioned about uh, animals needing somewhere to lie up. And obviously that's really important uh, that they've got somewhere dry and safe uh, to sit and chew the cud. 
but often uh, on some sites anyway, uh, you do have to be careful with this with reptiles because often these higher raised features can be really important, especially for one particular species. So the adder, which is actually now the UK's fastest uh, declining reptile species, we're really worried across the whole of Europe and the UK, they are uh, drastically declining. And one of the features that's really important for them are their hibernation sites. So unfortunately, they're really hard to work out uh, where adder hibernation sites are. But basically, the only way to tell is if you see an adder basking uh, in the early spring or kind of any time between uh, October to about mid-April, you see a reptile, an adder basking then, then you know it's on or near its hibernation site feature. And ideally, if you do have adders on your site and you can get some uh, either do the surveys yourself or get some support, try and locate these important features and make sure they don't get too poached or trampled or uh, laid on by um, uh, livestock. The second point I was going to make is about ponds. So often uh, you have ponds uh, next to your grasslands or you want to create or people often want to create or restore ponds next to their grasslands, uh, which I definitely recommend everyone uh, does if they don't have a pond on their land and it's uh, suitable. The best source of information for this is from the Freshwater Habitats Trust and their uh, pond creation toolkit. And there's a couple of really good diagrams in there, which is relevant to this talk, because uh, often people think when they've got a pond, uh, they need to put a fence around it to protect it so it doesn't get uh, overly grazed or, or interfered with, but actually that's kind of the opposite thing you want to do. You don't want uh, the edges of the pond to become too poached or too overgrazed, but grazing is critical to keep ponds open because you don't want too much scrub and you definitely don't want any trees um, around a pond because it shades them out, which makes them less biodiverse, and then also the leaf litter falls in, which makes them full of nutrients, uh, which you also do not want. So I think there's just another diagram here showing you how a uh, pond can su succeed so much quicker if you do not have uh, allow some sort of grazing on it and poaching I was going to mention as well really important for a lot of uh, certain vertebrate and plant species so a little bit of poaching is good but not too much and then my final point I was going to make was about uh, rotting piles of vegetation and how important they are in the landscape and especially for grass snakes uh, because this, they need this heat generated by the rotting vegetation in order to lay their eggs. And unfortunately, this feature is their kind of limiting factor, and there are less of them around in the landscape than there ever were. So I'd really recommend if people have, do have some vegetation arisings from management of their, la their land, that they utilise them for these piles. Um, you can use manure, uh, spoiled silage or hay bales, any, any sort of vegetation cuttings, really. And if you're really lucky, you'll get all the females traveling several kilometers from around the landscape and using these piles. They're obviously, they're an amazing, beautiful creatures to have on your uh, land. And so, yes, ideally in a nice scrubby corner is the best place to put them, bigger the better, topped up every year. And uh, hopefully they'll, uh, my colleagues will share a link in the chat box, which will give you more information um, about that. So that's just my quick uh, whistle stop tour to get hopefully get you thinking about reptiles more. Uh, please do look at our website for more information or get in touch with me. And hopefully in the future we can have uh, a longer conversation about uh, reptiles. So that's it from me. Thank you. Try and stop sharing my screen now. If I can. Oops. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. That was really great. Uh, I think the next step is Bill. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'll just share my screen. How are we doing? Uh, it looks good. It's, it's, not in a, it's not in the full screen mode. <laughs> yeah. 
No, okay. Um, we'll find that. There we go. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Great. Is that all right? Okay, great. Okay, well, this is this is us, um, Morecambe Bay, uh, and the sites that uh, we graze in this area. Just a quick run through. So there's 1,100 hectares of nature reserves um, in this system, and about 90% of it is rough grazing however you define that, not, not very good quality in farming terms. Um, the 30 hectares of it is better quality land over towards the coast in the Arnside and Silverdale area of outstanding beauty um, of hay meadows that we cut and make either big bales or small bales depending on the weather. Um, much of this land is designated um, because of the movement regulations that Hillary referred to, we, we now have to divide the, the different um, elements up into separate holdings. So every time we move cattle from um, one site to another, if they're more than 10 kilometers apart, then that counts as moving between holdings. So it, it's means that we have to notify um, the cattle movement service um, and um, make sure that the passports, the bits of paper that we hold, um, have recorded those movements. So it's a bit of extra bureaucracy that we could do without, but it, it does help us if there is a TB outbreak on one holding, it doesn't close the whole system, just means that the holding that's affected. There are 15 different landlords, um, all the usual suspects, the um, Wildlife Trusts and the RSPB, um, Natural England and the Forestry Commission um, and one or two private landlords as well. Um, the designations, uh, 620 hectares are National Nature Reserve and um, we uh, rent those either from the Forestry Commission or the um, or Natural England um, and most of the rest is designated um, site of special scientific interest. Of course the SAC designation, um, the European Habitats Directive is, is no longer um, extant so we can forget about that, not that, um, it, and not that it reduces the significance, the importance of the site. Um, I, I wanted to focus on a specific example to, um, to illustrate some of the complexities that arise when um, trying to organise the um, management of the livestock. This is Wharton Crag, um, a site close to the edge of Morecambe Bay, uh, in the Arnside and Silverdale um, area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, this is what it looked like in 1911. Um, mostly open grassland and scree, bit of limestone pavement on the top, not very much woodland or scrub. So quite, uh, quite a simple, straightforward prospect in terms of grazing. It, it became like that after generations of grazing with sheep and, and goats. Um, but the grazing was removed at some stage between the First and the Second World Wars. Um, and it gradually began to change so that by 2011 um, it looked something like this. So this is um, sort of a picture taken up here just on the edge of that limestone. So you can see how much um, woody growth has appeared um, on this slope here. So there's lots more woodland and scrub um, which you can see but quite a bit less of the grassland. Um, 
However, the main conservation objective was the grassland. So this site is, is designated as a site of special scientific interest. Um, and um, so that's really how the, um, the, the, the grazing um, has uh, featured in the management, trying to um, uh, maintain the grassland. So this is a picture um, from uh, the MAGIC um, website showing that the, the amount of, um, so the shaded areas are woodland and scrub. Uh, and you can see this, this um, oval that I've highlighted in red is where we've just um, been looking in the, the, the picture. And so in 2018, probably about 60 or 70% of that area was scrub and woodland whereas before it would have been much more open. Now that hasn't happened overnight. It's, it's happened in, in, in stages. Um, uh, and this is from a report um, uh, put together by what was the NCC then, Nature Conservancy Council, now Natural England. Um, they, they were concerned at this advance of the scrub and woodland and were keen to, um, to get a handle on it, to, to see how quickly it was progressing. 1963, in that same area, probably about 10 or 15% was um, scrubbed up. By 1981, um, some eight, 18 years later, we're probably about 50-50. And then 1988, uh, just a mere seven years later, we were probably the majority of the area was now um, under woodland and scrub. So clearly it, 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 it became more urgent because it looked as though the advance of the scrub uh, and the woodland um, was progressing at an ever faster rate. Um, so because it's a, a, a site of special scientific interest, then um, the, the state of these habitats was of concern. Um, and um, the site was designated in 1976. Uh, and these um, uh, statements of condition uh, are done on a, uh, a regular basis uh, over a number of years. And, and this is the, the current assessment showing that most of um, Wharton Crag, the areas of SSSI, are actually in favorable condition. So that's, that's quite encouraging. Um, the site itself was also listed in something called the Nature Conservation Review, a publication came out in 1977, where the um, senior scientist um, at NCC, Derek Ratcliffe, um, I, I guess he would have visited all these sites or had information about them and made an assessment about how well they were doing. He recorded that Wharton Crag was grade two, so not quite um, top notch in terms of its conservation status. He described the features thus, floristically rich in the limestone grassland um, with a mix of typical species that would be appropriate for a grade one site. He noted also that there was a lot of woodland and scrub um, and presumably he didn't feel quite comfortable with that. He went on to say that there was a complex mix of heterogeneous and disturbed habitats which he clearly didn't like. And that was his reason for um, nominating it as grade two. So, you know, this, this um, complexity was seen as something that perhaps was not um, quite suitable for an SSSI that was nominated um, for its grassland interest. Um, however, in the latest condition assessment carried out by Natural England, it does note that this is actually the best quality limestone grassland in Lancashire. So that maybe emphasizes that it's, it, it is important. You can, you can check, and I put, the, um, um, I put the link to that designation, that condition assessment, which you can just look up on the, um, on the website to um, see how it's doing. Um, so the site is in an agro-environment scheme, a countryside stewardship higher tier. Um, and, and this is the map showing how that complexity is represented within the scheme. 
clearly it's a it's a very complex business to try and map all these different habitat elements um, and make sense of it so it's hard to um, describe it and it's probably even harder to to manage it i mean how do you how do you um, in, uh, apply a management regime that will cater for the needs of all these different so there's deep beds of bracken in the middle here um, there's scrub the kind of thing that mark was just explaining might be good for um, reptiles um, there's quite dense close canopy woodland um, around these edges and then the nice bits of limestone grass and are just on the thinnest soils um, so this complexity is perhaps um, uh, more easily um, described in the term wood pasture, uh, which is in effect what the um, places like Wharton Crag have become. So when the cattle uh, are introduced, they graze the whole lot as a mosaic, as a complex. Uh, and you can see um, here are some cattle doing just that moving between the trees, a bit of browsing, um, a bit of grazing. These calves are learning right at the start of their um, grazing careers uh, just by watching. So wood pasture is a term that we like very much because it just encapsulates that complexity and that mosaic. Um, it maybe provides a more straightforward approach to the management of these complex sites, which we can see as being based largely on natural processes. In effect, it's not quite rewilding, it's more of a renaturing, uh, allowing nature to make more of the decisions. We have to be able to monitor um, what's going on in these different elements uh, and the focus on somewhere like Wharton Crag might be on the grassland and we could see very quickly after the grazing returned that it uh, was beginning to change so the grassland at the start would look something like this this is mainly sizzleria blue moor grass um, a characteristic upland limestone grassland species um, and you can see elements of scrub um, establishing and, and beginning to take off so this was at the beginning um, and by the end, after several years of grazing, um, just very low density, maybe um, on a site of about 18 hectares um, in the map, we, we would have um, six to eight um, uh, younger cattle um, that would um, be grazed on the site for maybe um, between four and eight weeks during the later the later months of the year um, so that would allow um, the the plants and the insects to complete their life cycles during the growing season and then the cattle would come in and eat off the ranker stuff but even with such a lax grazing regime the grassland was able to benefit um, and, and gradually um, for the um, the dominance of the grasses to be reduced and, and other plants to compete and establish. Um, and now and again, we see some, some really nice fl flushes of something quite special. This is Northern Marsh Orchid, and, and that has a habit of turning up even on these, these dry limestone grasslands. Um, so the cattle are the main management tool. Um, they do three jobs. Uh, they graze the grassland, they trample the bracken, and they browse the scrub. Um, here we are encouraging them to come into an area of bracken to trample it. And you can see they've made some quite um, uh, serious impacts. They're coming for water there and we are giving them some um, supplementary feed um, here. So it, it makes the job of managing them much easier. We can call them, they're, they're, they're waiting for us to arrive. And when they hear us, they'll usually come um, and find their way down to this one spot rather than us having to go trailing all over to find them. Um, but we may need to carry out some interventions, um, uh, coppicing some of these areas of scrub which are too tall, uh, too dense,
that the capitals have any impact on. And then um, this is particularly targeted at the fritillary butterflies, the high, high brown fritillary. Uh, there's also the pearl border fritillary on this site. And what we're looking to do there is to uh, promote the establishment of um, uh, colonies of common dog violet, which is the food plant for these fritillary butterflies. Um, without this kind of management, then the bracken and the scrub would just um, be too dense and too shaded um, for the violets. But a little bit of um, um, intervention like this will promote the, uh, the establishment of the violets. So browsing is, is uh, a, a principal concern. And um, I promised Hilary that we'd talk about you. You is um, a feature of many of these sites. It's certainly present on Wharton Crag uh, and the cattle are very keen on it. However, it does provoke quite a lot of concern because most people are aware that it is toxic. However, we've, we've learned not to be concerned as long as the, the cattle have other um, sources of nutrition that they can, they can return to. So they'll go and browse the you for a little bit and then go and eat something that's less toxic. Um, hazel is present on site. You can see that um, this, this one has been quite actively browsed on repeated occasions, so it helps to suppress that. Hawthorne, because of its um, prickly defences, is, 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 is much better defended. We see much less impact on that. Um, and, and here's an animal, uh, one of our beasts, going after the berries in the autumn. Um, so browsing is, is, is a key behaviour for, for these cattle. We think of them as grazing animals, but we know even where they have some, some good pasture, um, as in this picture on the left, uh, where they have access to browse, they will quite routinely go over and browse. This is blackthorn. So again, it's, it's a well defended, got some very fierce spine, but they still insist that um, uh, they, they're going to have access to it. This is a cow and you can see just behind there, um, its calf is um, following suit, learning the ropes, learning those behaviors. Um, and so there must be something in the brows that is quite specific in nutritional terms um, that they're looking for. Um, uh, Hillary referred to the cow's tongue, um, uh, and I think that's probably its principal asset when it comes to browsing, because they, we see them use it to, to pull the branches down so they can eat them. Um, we, we, we're, we're keen to promote this behavior. So um, in the winter, if we have calves, then we'll um, cut bits of ivy, um, and, and feed them. And that way the calf learns from a very young age um, the, the, the benefits of, um, of eating um, woody, woody plants following in the path of its mother. So it's, it's, it's developing browsing as a culture. And if you can see this video, no. So what you should be seeing is, is um, a fairly good example of browsing um, in action um, in a fairly extreme way, but it's not functioning. Never mind, I'll um, go on. So just a quick roundup by showing you how this, um, um, this culture works um, within the rest of the system. Here we are. Um, on Whitbarrow uh, at the northern end of the site and then Ingleborough over here, um, much less woodland, but the managers at Ingleborough are keen to see a lot more trees beginning to establish. And that's exactly what um, is going on. Um, down here we have Hutton Roof, which is another lump of limestone um, just running along the side of the um, uh, the M6. Um, and again, that's very much wanting to go in the wood pasture direction. Here we are on Hutton Roof, uh, looking back um, 
towards Morecambe Bay, round the corner, as it were. There's Wharton Crag that we started off with. Um, there's Ironside Knot, another very similar lump of limestone. And in the, the valley here, we've got some, um, some um, moss land, hail moss, uh, an area of wetland, fen and bog, um, which we also graze. So the, the, the cattle are moved around these different sites, um, always being grazed at um, low intensity, um, low stocking rates, um, and just being given plenty of choice. Uh, we keep traditional breeds, native breeds, um, the Morecambe Bay Conservation Grazing. We are a business. We have to um, generate sufficient um, income from this um, uh, way of working in order to keep us going. Um, the suckler cows, native breeds, red poll is the primary breed. We, we also have short horns and a few blue greys, although gradually they're being replaced by the by the red poll. Um, the cows rear their own calves, um, so all the milk that they're producing goes to the calf and they grow quite well, um, which is important because um, come the winter, they have to stay out in all weathers. So they grow a, a, a reasonable um, hairy coat, which gives them some extra insulation. Um, but basically they're, they're living for most of the winter on the milk that their um, mothers are providing, plus this um, not, not very nutritious looking grass, but they seem to do all right on it. Um, in the second year, as weanlings, they get, have to take off on their own um, and uh, begin to graze these other nature reserves um, off the older um, rearing cattle. Um, and then that process goes on for a number of years um, until eventually we have an animal that's, that's ready for sale. This is a, um, a shorthorn steer that's six years old uh, and, and time for him to go. We then think about finding a market. Um, we are both organic and pasture for life certified. So both these, we think, are important elements, um, certifying the, um, the right aspects of the way we manage this. Um, you can check out the standards on the um, uh, Pasture for Life website, um, and hopefully you would, you would agree with me that they are a very good match with um, the conservation grazing requirements. Similarly for the, the organic, the two complement each other very well. Um, the only thing I think we would like to see in there is a bit more emphasis on the wood aspect of, we, we perhaps could describe it as wood pasture for life, um, but that's something to, to discuss perhaps. Anyway, um, there's a quick dash through uh, and um, I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was great. Um, we've got the last speaker up, Tilary, if you would like to start. Thank you. Is it all right if I... Cassie, are you going to um, share my... Go <sighs> <Not> again. <laughs> Hi, uh, yes, I'm just sharing it now. Just trying to go to back to the beginning. Bear with me. Thank you. Oh, the joys of Zoom. <laughs> uh, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to pick up part way through. Uh, so when, when I start it, you're going to need to skip back to the beginning, I'm afraid. But that's uh, <laughs> where we left it in our test run. So I do apologise, uh, everybody, but bear with us. <laughs> Getting a sneak preview. <laughs> have you got control now? I have. I'll see. If need be, I'll start it here. It's fine. Oh, 
Well, let me go backwards. If you try using the, <laughs> the, the arrows left and right, that might allow you to. I haven't got any arrows, but... Oh, we're going forward now. <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to hand it back to you. There we and go. Then... So I think we've got the beginning now. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so good evening, everyone. Um, so my name's Clary. Um, the picture I've got here is actually a National Trust Upland Hill Farm that I ran for a few years. Um, and basically sort of conservation grazing um, and farming for nature in general has been my, um, my route into farming, I suppose. Um, I haven't grown up on a farm. Um, I'm sort of a, a new entrant, I suppose. Um, and actually, this has been how I've managed to get opportunities on farms. Um, and the farm here in the photo, Sunday Sav, um, started out as a scholarship and then I ended up running it for three years. We grazed the cattle, um, a small group of Welsh black cattle, right up to this, this snowy ridge line here up on the left. Um, and the other place, um, the other I've worked on farms since I was um, quite young, really, sort of offering, offering um, to, to also volunteering on other people's farms. Um, and I also worked on a farm in the Rhone Alps for a while, where they had very much the um, Havadahendra system or transhumance, where you take, take the stock up the mountain in the summer to graze off the sort of alpine meadows um, and I suppose that's my first lesson that I would say that I've learned um, the, the lady on the left riding there was um, my boss Mark Kylie Worthington um, and she very much inspired me so um, I think uh, like Hilary said at the beginning that, that Bill was one of her grazing heroes I think it's really important to find people or um, organizations that can can inspire you um, and that you can ask for advice. There's a couple who call themselves Horned Beef Co on Twitter, and um, they've turned into sort of lifelong friends and inspiration doing something similar. So um, I'm also part of the Nature Friendly Farming Network, and I work for Farmers Union, Farmers Union of Wales, and I think that's really important. And obviously all the organisations that have organised this tonight, so don't go it alone, um, ask for help. So we are now very proud tenants and um, we've got a 10 year FBT with the National Trust. Um, my partner Ned is also not from a farming background, so um, we're very much learning even more so on the job. Um, we also rent um, some other upland land nearby um, and some woodland as well um, through Ned's parents. Uh, I don't, we, didn't, we haven't touched that much on the finances. Um, as new farmers without um, much, uh, no land or much capital behind us, we are both still working off farm. And I think a lot of farmers have to do that these days. Um, we've got sheep and cattle um, and horse. Um, the cattle, I've put the breeds there that we've got. So Welsh blacks and, and, and a real um, other mix of, of, of breeds. I would say, I think, um, Bill, you said something about their early on into their grazing career. Um, and I think you're bang on there. I think a lot of it comes down to lifetime experience. Um, and so we have tried to buy cattle um, from other conservation graze herds that have been in similar on similar conditions. They've learned from their mums. Um, and another really important thing I'd say is to buy cattle from very much trusted sources make sure they're from the same um, TB zone, you know, ask about their owners and BVD status, um, ask if they've been exposed to ticks, because um, that's a massive one for us, because um, we graze up somewhere where it's a, there's a very heavy tick burden. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd say in terms of um, infrastructure, uh, Hillary's touched on it, we, graze a few different sites um, and it's they're starting to increase now and there's a lot of faff involved and you have to make sure that you whoever's working with you 
um, your cattle, your infrastructure is right for doing lots of loading and unloading. Um, hurdles are your friend, gates are your friend, string is your friend, um, and quiet cattle. Don't rush them, let them see it a few days in advance, feed them in there if need be, keep it calm. Um, and I do think that that makes all the difference because um, there is there can be quite a lot of faff involved in sites that aren't particularly um, accessible. Um, sorry, it's not letting me click forward. The next thing I'm going to say, if it lets me click forward, oh yeah, is Rona. So this white, she's a Dexter cross, a uh, white bread short horn, and she is our leader cow. Um, the photo on the left is of the weekend, actually, um, where she just started following me without being asked. Um, keep your leader cows. They are the best Judases ever and they will make your life much easier. Um, once you've got one that you've discovered is a little bit more bolshy or likes feed a bit more or is a bit noisier, they are very useful. Um, and you can see here, she actually walked the rest of the cattle up, um, higher up in the upland um, grazing that we've got. We were actually hoping they'd stick around the woodland a bit more, but she marched them off. Um, and they're so useful for all those situations. We, we, um, the tenancy we've got here is on a floodplain. Um, and if we have to go out in the middle of the night, we just call Rona and she brings the rest of them um, to us. The next slide, if I click, if it will click on, is about wood pasture. Um, another place that we graze is Ned's parents' woodland. Um, it was originally meadows and then it was conifers and then it got planted up with broadleaf and is very, very thick. Lots of saplings or lots of trees now of the same age. Um, and so it has required quite a bit of extra uh, cutting through um, and clearance. And then we followed on with, um, with the cattle. Um, and that's been really satisfying to see because like Bill was saying and Hillary was saying with the, with the grazing, the browsing, it's really interesting. And they've been just licking the, the like pulling the ivy off the trees like spaghetti. Um, really great to see. The only thing I would say, um, especially in places that are full of brambles, is you can spend half your time searching for the cattle. So instead of checking them um, and watching them for any problems, Use feed. I used to be a little bit purist about feed, but yeah, sugar beet is now my favourite thing. So if you need to make a noise with some with some beet and you need to feed them a bit more to get them used to coming to one spot, or like Hilary said with the water, it's absolutely useful. It's really useful. Um, really great to see different things coming through in the woodland and, and, and opening it out and creating these sort of little glades. Um, really quite, you really see the physical impact the cattle have. Um, I'd also recommend doing quite a lot of watching your cattle um, or your livestock. We um, uh, it's, it's hard for us a little bit because both of us work, or many people do, work off the farm as well. But you need to make sure you have that time just to watch your stock and really notice if anything, um, if anything is going on. I try and speed up because I know there's, there's quite a few interesting questions coming through. Um, I would also recommend anyone who's been offered places to graze in the summer um, work back from winter because it's very easy. We've got lots of different places as options in the summer, but in the winter, we don't really have um, the right sort of housing for our stock um, or the money to invest in it. So our cattle have to be outwintered. And the only suitable place that's got some grazing is also a floodplain. Um, so we have to make sure that we are not going over our carrying capacity um, and that we can support everything through quite a long, cold Snowdonia winter if need be, um, and that we can get enough silage or hay in if necessary. So just work it back. And also that applies to your constraints with time as well. You know, if you're working off farm um, where you need to travel to, work it back logistically, because a lot of it does come, back, come down to logistics um, uh, at the end of the day. Um, the other thing I'd say is, whilst conservation grazing isn't a new thing, it's not something that is always done particularly widely. Um, but I think 
whether or not uh, someone nearby or a farmer that you know is doing conservation grazing, I feel like we can all learn an awful lot from each other and from other farmers, no matter what system they've got in place. Um, and I've said, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it's all about stockmanship and land management. Um, and even if you've got different, you're trying to achieve different outcomes at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. Um, and so I'd very much recommend listening to other farmers um, and learning from them because I've had some amazing mentors over the years. And even though they farm in a very different way to me, um, I they're generally right, annoyingly. Um, yeah, again, quickly, fencing uh, can be a bit of a nightmare, especially when you've got a small amount of cattle on a large area. Um, paying for that fencing is never going to be paid back in the meat you produce, generally. So um, I would get very good at patching, very good at fencing. Um, I'm very lucky that my um, beloved partner is a very good uh, dry stone waller and is very patient when I ask him to put a trillion gates in everywhere. Um, look for financial support for it. The National Park has, the Snowden National Park has helped us a lot. Um, so just explore all the different avenues you've got. Um, the next thing, if it clicks on, um, make sure that you enjoy it because I have met some people who the idea of it is wonderful, um, that, that they, it appeals to their ethics, it appeals to what they want to do. But at the end of the day, if you're not, happy enough to trudge around after cattle for hours on end and deal with the faff of loading and unloading um, and midges and brambles, um, you're not going to enjoy it. So even though this is the Instagram photos that everyone sees, it's not always the, the reality of it. So I think you have to really want to, you have to enjoy it. Otherwise you, you won't put the, the time and the effort in to, um, to make it a success. Sorry, I'm trying to speed up. Um, nutritionally, I would just say, um, make sure you know your livestock and you know their condition scores and you're keeping an eye on them. Um, I made a mistake with these cattle where I put them up the hill behind there um, as the millennia was drying off, uh, dying off. Um, they're already uh, they were already in calf and they had calves on them and um, they kept coming down and they kept coming down to the bottom here and not wanting to stay on the top. They were telling me, nah, there's not enough up there for us. <laughs> um, and the other thing I would say is even though some people might want you to graze in certain areas, certain densities, um, what you've got to remember is that you're the livestock keeper. The animals are your responsibility. So no matter what someone else wants, at the end of the day, it has to be down to what you and your animals decide. Um, Hillary has touched on this, um, but really watch their browsing. It's amazing to watch and make sure that you know what you're trying to, to get and the different species that you're trying to enhance. Um, I adore bog asphodel and then I since found out that it can give them sunburn, um, which I've not actually seen on the Welsh Blacks before, but I think there's plenty of other things for them to graze. But yeah, it's, it's obvious, you know, learn what's around you, learn what they're browsing and learn what you're trying to enhance. Um, in terms of handling, um, particularly if you're grazing for other people, make sure that they are confident with your stock. Um, Otherwise, you know, yeah, issues can come about. We try and make sure that our stock get exposed to quite a few different people, to groups, to dogs, because um, one of the woodlands that we graze got a lot of dog walkers. Um, so just slowly, slowly build up people's confidence. Um, and also don't be afraid to tell people to get out the way and not get involved if you think it's going to make your cattle suspicious. <laughs> um, yeah, and, that, and that's it for my lessons. The only other thing I was going to comment on um, was these are um, oh, two steers that were fattening this year on one of our meadows. Um, we're really trying to improve the species rich um, riverside meadows in the farm that we've just taken on. But as you can see, um, if they get left to rest, it seems to be just rushes that come up. So any advice anyone's got on leaving very wet land um, to rest over summer without rushes taking over? Um, I would be, yeah, much appreciated. Um, if anyone wants to see a few more photos, um, I do put some not 
you know, not just the Instagram filtered ones up there. Um, I'm on Instagram or Twitter as Snowdonia Shepherdess. Um, and then there's a few folks in there. We, we graze um, the Celtic Rainforest Project and a few special areas of conservation as well. So there's some quite nice photos in there. Um, I'll stop there because I know there's questions. So, yeah, thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Cassie, for doing the presentation as well. <laughs> All right, I think that was all the speakers done. Thank you so much, uh, Hilary and everyone else for doing your presentation. They were really great, very different to each other. So I think uh, that gave you a bit of a range of um, examples. Hilary giving a really good introduction to the practicalities. And then we had some real examples in the real world um, on how these can be actually applied on land. And also really good to hear about different species that we don't maybe often talk about that you might want to consider when you are preparing your management plans. Um, so yeah, we've got quite a few questions in. I know it's half past seven, but all of the um, panelists agree that they can stay on for a bit longer. Um, Hilary, are you happy to stay on as well? I couldn't ask you while you were speaking. So we might just um, extend the session for half an hour and finish at seven, uh, eight, sorry, if everyone is happy with that. Uh, of course, if people need to leave, um, Feel free to leave we'll just continue with the questions and whoever wants to stay can stay on we'll make sure we'll also share the questions that are in the q a box at the moment uh, with you um in the follow-up emails so yeah if you do have to leave then yeah you will still have them and um, so let's have a look at the questions i would actually like to start it off with a question that i that i was um given via email before the session by someone who uh, couldn't attend but i thought it was a really nice one to um to ask um, can you give advice to ecologists who uh, would like to learn about farming practices? Where, where are good places to start if they are already established ecologists? I don't know who would like to take that. Um, we have a course in Pont called Understanding Livestock Grazing and Working with Farmers. That might be a good place to start. <laughs> we'll be delivering that this summer because it, there's an awful lot there, there can be a big divide, can't there? A big sort of chasm between ecologists and farmers and they both treat each other with a bit of suspicion. But actually there's plenty of common ground. And if if an ecologist can learn a few farming terms and what, what we want to talk about, that can be really helpful. And you know, you, you, there can be a, a blending of interests over time, definitely. What do you think, Bill? Yes, I, I think so. And, and presumably the, the changes that are in prospect with the move away from area based payments to um, public money for public goods, then then farmers will be keen to learn from ecologists and environmentalists generally. Um, so it, 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 it should be a two way um, coming together from both sides, hopefully. Great, thank you for that. Um, so with the, in the Q&A box, we've got a few questions. Um, are the cattle managed as suckler herds and how do you define high and low density? Yeah, I guess there are got two questions. So, uh, uh, ours is a suckler herd. Um, and um, as I explained, the, the, the calves stay on the, the cow uh, at, at least for 10 months um, and occasionally for quite a bit longer if, if, we're, um, if we're prepared to um, let the cow have a, uh, a year off from breeding then we sometimes leave the calves on so that they, they, they suckle for much longer periods. Um, and, and we find that the longer that the calves are suckling then the better they grow. So it's, it's, it's not that we're um, necessarily losing, losing out on the numbers of calves we're producing, but that's compensated for by the fact that we get better quality calves. So when they, when they are weaned, they're, they're, they're bigger and fitter and, and better able to, to meet the challenges that they, they go off to face on these, these, these nature reserves and the rather rougher ground. Uh, our cattle are a suckler herd as well. And once we've weaned the calves, probably it's about nine or 10 months, 
they might go and manage hay meadows or the fungi land and until they're a bit older, same as Bill does really, and then they follow the cattle around on the rougher stuff. And how do you define high and low density? Um, we've got something like 22 cows on 80 hectares on the fen. So that's a cow to four hectares, which is similar to what you've got, isn't it, Bill? Um, the, the last time I, I, I did a, um, a tally, I think our overall stocking rate was below 0.1 livestock unit per hectare. Um, and when you think that um, for a, a, a dairy herd, it might be as much as 2.5 um, livestock units per hectare, then, then clearly there's, there's a big difference. But there's everything in between. And, um, and, and in conservation grazing, you're trying to set the stocking rate at a level that is commensurate with the, the, the requirements and the capability of the land. Um, so you wouldn't expect to be um, getting anywhere near the, um, the average stocking rates for a commercial um, farming system. But having said that, you know, at certain times of the year, on certain types of better uh, um, land, even on a nature reserve, you might be getting up to say something like one or, or even 1.5 livestock units per hectare, but that, that wouldn't be sustained for, for very long because you'd be monitoring the vegetation to make sure that you, you were able to adjust the grazing or remove the livestock um, at the point that they were beginning to have negative impacts. Yeah, we're, we're very similar. So um, about 0.2 livestock units a hectare, but exactly as Bill said, during the summer months, um, some of those are only there for a few months. Um, some are on other areas for, for that much higher density. So um, I've done suckler hairs before. These ones were very much at the beginning of our um, farming journey here on the new tenancy. So they will be a suckler herd at some point. <laughs> Um, thank you. The next question, I think this is a good one for Mark. I think it's more of a comment, but you might have some suggestions for this. There was a question coming from Rachel saying the problem with leaving scrubby edges is that it makes hedge management difficult. Do you have any suggestions for this, Mark? Yeah, well, I, I guess it's it's a tricky one and it depends on your, your, your land and how much space you, you've got available. But I'd say that you know, having buffer strips along the edges of your, your hedgerows could, you know, there's no reason that if you do need to get in there to manage your hedges that you think that those scrubby edges couldn't be knocked back at that particular uh, year, however, wherever your rotation is in terms of hedge management, or obviously allowing your hedgerow to grow up bigger and not cutting it every year and then just laying it every, you know, three to five years could could also work. So I guess, you know, but if it's not feasible to have the scrubby edge along the particular that particular hedgerow, then see if there's another location on the farm or on the land where you could possibly put it, I guess would be my um, advice. I don't know if anyone's got any other comments about that. I think, I think it's very much down to the individual, isn't it? Some of us um, are more relaxed about those things. Um, for, for, for us, of course, we, we because we're tenants of, um, um, conservation organisations, then, then we're very much um, um, dictated by, by the management requirements for the land. And in, in, in some instances, um, the, um, the site manager who wants to um, um, promote, to, to um, create those um, more um, um, dynamic edges has removed fences um, and just said, "Well, let the cattle go where they where they want to create a um, a more dynamic interaction." The, the kind of thing that you were describing, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, so, if if that's what the site manager wants, then you know we we generally say, "Okay, that we'll give it a try." Um, okay. Okay, thank you. I hopefully uh, that answered the question. I think that was a really good suggestion. Um, a question from Ross. Uh, do graziers need to keep movement records if they graze on land that is adjacent and touching triple size? If, if the land is 
not theirs, then they would have to record their movements to the land. Yes, because it's between a holding. So if it's going off your holding onto next door triple SI, then it's it's moving to another place. I'm guessing if it's the other case, if it's not, if they are just next to triple SI, is I'm I'm guessing this is like concerns if in causing maybe some damage, but if it's their land. Um, so, so say for mountain common grazing, you don't need to record the movement if your farm is next to the mountain when your sheep go up. But um, if you're just a bit down the road, then you do move that. So in that case, you wouldn't need to. But and in that case, the triple SI in the mountain doesn't belong to the to the commoners. So it would also depend whether it was a common. So, so if 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 the land in question is part of your holding, then you're not required under the regulations to keep yeah. a record. But even even if that's the case, I would argue it still makes sense to keep good records of where your livestock are going within your grazing system, so that um, maybe a few years down the down the road you can't remember how you were grazing it back then, then you would have that record to refer to. And, and you may find that there are some interesting lessons to be learned just by looking back over how you've done things in the past that would help you to, to, to organize things better in the future. So we, we, we have a spreadsheet where we can see at a glance where all the animals have been um, on a week by week basis throughout the year um, and 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 you know it's it, it's very useful. It's quite tedious having to update it, but it actually proves to be very useful. Um, often the site manager will come to me and say, "Can you tell me um, what grazing you've done on on my site for the for the previous twelve months or whatever?" And of course I can't remember, so but I've got a record that I can refer to, and and so that usually calms things down. <laughs> Just add something that we found um, movement licenses aside um, with grazing. And I think the question was an SAC. Um, we had to get a, a PDO consent. So potentially damaging operation for, for grazing um, cattle and pigs um, in the in the SAC. So even though it was under our management, you still had to get that from, in our case, it was um, NRW or I think is Natural England the equivalent? Um, in, in England, yeah. So yeah, just to be, yeah, just to be aware of that as well. Thank you. Um, this is a really great one, I think, for anyone that is kind of thinking about starting on the journey. If you're a landowner, how can you find out who could graze your land or particular areas? Is there a website or a forum where farmers can say they have X amount of cattle or sheep at the certain times of the year for rent or loan, or is it more word of mouth? I've only ever heard a word of mouth, but Hilary might know. Um, yeah, you usually just sort of find out that land is available, don't you? And um, you know, if I, I would sort of talk to people locally because if your land's around you, it's much better to have somebody nearby that doesn't have to travel miles and miles to put their stock on yeah. um, try the local smallholders group try breed societies so if you think you want dexters on your land try the dexter cattle society and they'll they'll tell you if there's somebody local um, i don't think there's well there's the nibblers forum i suppose whether that could be used bill you can talk yes, about and, that and, and, and it is used from time to time for that kind of mm. thing but the trouble with nibblers of course is it's it has a wide um, remit and, and you know there's no certainty that you're going to reach somebody who is near enough yeah. to um, to help you. Uh, local auction marts uh, are often you know they, they'll have a notice board where you could just um, uh, write an advert explaining that you've got some grazing and and, and that may attract some interest. Um, I, I would say that when you're setting up grazing with somebody that you must 
prepare a grazing license that you both agree on the, sort of the terms of the grazing. So how long it's for and what the maximum number of animals is and who's responsible for the fencing and who's going to check them. And that sort of thing is really important. I agree. I think there was lots of really good suggestions. <laughs> I guess this is maybe slightly linked with um, cattle leasing. Any more information on that? Um, well, we, we, we've we started um, one of our agreements with Natural England um, through a leasing agreement. It, it happened to be for um, the Ingleborough Reserve, which was a long way from us. Um, and um, it would have it would have required quite a significant capital investment on our part. Um, so they 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 were keen to secure um, our services, uh, and and so it was a it was as Hilary said a very good way of tempting someone who's maybe you know, not not finding it that easy to. Um, to help. So, so the arrangement there was, just as Hillary said, um, Natural England paid for the purchase of the cattle. We took them on, they became part of our herd. Um, and um, in fact, we, we, we've now ceased that um, relationship. And when the time came for us to um, uh, halt the lease, we also gave back the cattle or the equivalent, um, the equivalent live weight in cows, if that makes sense. Um, so it, it, it's an arrangement that does work really well. Um, and I, I, I dare say between us, Hillary, we could um, provide some example agreements of, you know, what 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 would... Um... Yes, if, if somebody wants to email us, like we've got cattle leasing agreements that have been checked out by a land agent to make sure everything's okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you uh, can, uh, Cassie can share Hillary's email with you as well in the chat, so you can contact them directly about these documents. Um, are there welfare concerns with the invisible fencing? These are known in the dog training world to be unpleasant tools and best avoided. Emma can answer that one. <laughs> Hello. Um, <laughs> So uh, we've had we have a, um, a beha animal behaviorist who is um, working alongside us on a trial. Um, she hasn't found any problems whatsoever, and just observing the cattle, they certainly aren't concerned about the collars or the system. They learn it very quickly. Um, your, the training is absolutely essential to do well to do it properly, um, and to make sure you ground truth the geofence as well with the with the collar in your hand as well. So um, it's all about training, design, and just being sensible and keep a risk assessment. Make sure you've mitigated all of the risks, and um, that you know it, this system is an absolute lifeline for particularly for common land grazing, extensive grazing systems, and particularly where you've got dangerous hazards like roads. I mean, wearing a, a geofencing collar versus getting knocked down the road, I'd say there's not really, there's not really a contest. You know, it's certainly, um, you know, it does help to improve the safety of graze, grazing and um, it'll make sure that we can continue to graze um, the common land and, and other dangerous, more well, potentially dangerous sites. And also keep, you can keep your livestock out of bogs and, you know, it, it's and the tracking feature on the collars is is excellent as well. So you know, it, it improves the safety of the livestock no end. I think on the dog collars, there there was a dial you could turn it up and give them a big shock or a little shock. Um, there's no such dial on the cattle collars, so they just get. It's not. Have you held a collar, Emma, and felt what the shock's like? Yeah. So the shock is one to two percent of the strength of the shock from an electric fence. And also, I forgot to mention that it's not just a shock collar. You know, it's it the shock's preceded by an audio warning, so they get to learn the audio, um, well, the noise, and then they don't, um, yeah, that they know to that they can avoid a shock by uh, responding to the noise by turning away. Cattle are very adaptable. They learn pretty quickly, don't they? They're very smart. 
they learned after the first, mm. when they were introduced to the system at first, they learned straight away what the audio signal meant and they haven't really, they didn't really test it. Um, yeah, it's been a great success so far. Mm. And um, just to add to um, what Emma was saying from my experience as well, I guess they yeah, saying that it's a lifeline for in meadow setting you are sometimes talking about strips of you know few meters where you might want to exclude your cattle because there are a few orchids there that you might might want to safeguard and that's absolutely impossible with this uh, yeah this these colors can be absolutely perfect for that <laughs> um, there was a question about deer uh, have you any issues with deer and tb We, we don't have any deer around here, but obviously, yeah, they can carry TB as well. But yeah, not not for us here. No, we don't we don't have deer here either, Bill. Yeah, we we have lots of deer, um, but um, until recently, not much TB. Um, but you know, it 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 is uh, getting closer all the time. We we've, we've had two or three outbreaks um and yeah so not not us personally but outbreaks on adjoining farms that have caused us to be caught up in the radial in 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 the testing regime that follows an outbreak like that um so it's 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 becoming an increasing concern and knowing that that, that deer can spread it then it it um it, it doesn't make us any more relaxed about it, but in the end, you know, we we are where we are, and and we have to um, do the best we can with it. Thank you. Um, there is a question about toxicity of plants. Can bluebells be toxic to grazing animals if there are a lot of the plant in a pasture? If, if, bluebells. If, 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 sorry, Harry, sorry. you go first. <laughs> Bluebells are, are very susceptible to trampling. So possibly if you could avoid grazing that pasture while they're up and about, then you, you get best of both worlds. You get a nice bluebell sward and you don't risk poisoning your animals. Um, I don't know how palatable they are, do you, Bill? They, they are palatable to an extent, but not, you know, not in, the, in, in, the, in a major way. So it is quite possible for, for bluebells to survive in in grey situations, albeit somewhat diminished, and then if you remove the grazing or change the grazing regime, they can come back quite quickly. Uh, I have heard that they are toxic if if eaten in sufficient quantity. The 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 old adage that the um, the poison is in the dose is 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 a good kind of um, uh, summary of how the thing works. And so bluebells are unlikely to be a problem for the animal as long as they've got plenty of other things to eat. And, and that would be my, my, my philosophy pretty well. So all, all the plants that Hillary listed, we, we have on different sites and um, we see the animals eating all of them from time to time. But as far as we know, none of the problems that we have encountered are in any way associated with with eating any of those plants oh, great thank you um i think maybe we've got time for let's do uh, one more question and uh, i know there were some there were quite um we already talked about uh, the age of calves when they start grazing and the kind of stocking density but emma might be able to answer a few more on the on the q a if she if she can <laughs> Uh, I'll ask one um, that asks about wood pasture. How would you create wood pasture upon existing lowland uh, permanent grassland? Bear in mind, all grass farm with sheep and cattle. Probably you'd have to start planting some trees. Wow. Um, so it will be, up, you know, that it, it will be about designing a system. And, and there's lots of um, information on the internet uh, about how farmers have gone about this. In fact, there's a very good example, um, uh, Pont Bren. Are you familiar with that, Hilary? 
Yes. Oh, a little bit. Yes. So that that's often held up as a um, a, as a really good case study. It's um, a, a sheep farm um, where um, the the owner was very keen to go down this route of, of having more trees, um, and and so that would be a good a, a good example, a good case study to refer to to get some some ideas. I mean, here we we. we we don't really have that problem, you know, that the trees seem to want to come um, of their own accord. And, and it's a question of sort of managing that process in a way which doesn't, um, doesn't give way completely um, so that we lose all the grass and then the other habitats. Um, so it's, 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 it's a slightly different, but I guess if you're starting from scratch, you have that opportunity to design a planting pattern and a species composition um, to suit your situation. So you would look at the soils, you would look at what species are appropriate for that context uh, and what other objectives you may have. I was just going to add the the woodland that we graze um, was a planted woodland um, back in the 80s, early 90s, um, it was felled conifers and they planted it with broadleaves. Um, the only thing I'd say is not to plant, not to plant too dense um, and also to try and let quite a lot of natural regen come in as well. Um, and Ned's dad who planted them is a little bit disappointed about how um, a lot of extra regen came in and, and it's really, really thick in some areas. So it's it's made quite a sort of um, uh, they're all of very similar ages and stages. Um, and so actually we're cutting some of them down to allow the cattle in. So I think I'd just say if you're starting from scratch, um, allow some regen and, 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 and keep mixing it up, keep cutting some areas back and some not, um, so that it's not too uniform, I suppose. Okay, thank you very much. If anyone... Um... If there was nothing else to add to this question, then um, I would like to wrap it up uh, tonight. So thank you again very much for uh, everyone joining us and for all the speakers uh, for really amazing and interesting presentations. I hope that you found it uh, inspiring and interesting. I definitely learned a lot myself. Um, and just to um, say that we will be sending a follow-up email. Uh, it should be coming out tomorrow from Zoom, so you will have the recording there if you wanted to share it with anyone or we'll also put some uh, extra links there to the project that were mentioned. And I mentioned before this was the first part out of three in a series. So the second part is going to be exactly in two weeks. Uh, it's going to be Thursday, again, uh, starting at the same time at six o'clock. But perhaps we should leave two hours for the next one, just uh, seeing from how many people are interested in, uh, from so many questions. Um, the second question will be led by Emma Douglas, another member from Pond, and we'll be looking into a bit more detail into the types of breeds and exactly what breed is good for what setting and what outcomes. So that's the second part of the series. I think the Cassie was already sharing the registration links with you in the chat, so you can register there. And again, we will be promoting it on our social media, so we can also uh, see there. Uh, just very quickly, um, last thing, that there is a super quick survey. It should just pop up when you uh, turn your, once you finish the session and turn the window off. I haven't tried it before, so hopefully it will just appear. And it's uh, very quick, only three questions. So if you've got a minute just to uh, let us know how you found the session, that would be really great. And, and I think that's it from me and from us for tonight. Uh, thank you very much and have a good evening. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye.